podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this last uh, series, the last of the series on the esoteric astrology. Hi, everybody. BL and I are really excited to offer you this information, which I don't think any of us have in the past uh, introduced this to the Moria Federation. So this is a new, new and um, BL has included uh, the handouts on this somewhere there for you uh, on, on, you know, on the panel at, at the bottom there. And uh, if you haven't downloaded that, you're welcome to do that, to come along. But these instructions are good for you to have. So for those of you that don't normally download, I would really highly recommend that you do. So here we go. So we're finally concluding this part of the opposites. Um, it's been a, a delight to offer this because um, so much of what the Tibetan teaches us is all about opposites and the dualities that these opposites create. Okay, I'm going to move on. You mean you want me to move the slides? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, oh, I'm, just, I'm okay. just sitting over here enjoying you being able to talk and not me. <laughs> if I could move in my wood. So it's all a balancing act. And we're going to do a little quote here. The swing of the pendulum between the pairs of opposites gradually adjusts until the point of equilibrium is reached and man acts rightly because the law of love or of the soul directs from above and not because either good or bad desire attract him on either hand. I feel like this was written for me. I will be presenting my chart and I have so much Libra and here he talks about equilibrium and reaching that point of balance like this is just made for me even this beautiful picture here so I really appreciate that so yeah we have to reach that point of balancing the two it's not one or the other it's not a seesaw thing it's a point of balance between the opposites by now I think you all have gotten that so we saw that the aspirant has three pairs of opposites to deal with as he progresses towards light and liberation. So on the physical plane, it's the balance between the dense and the etheric. Average person is not even aware of the etheric. All they're aware of is when they have vitality and when they don't have vitality. It is fought out on the path of purification. And we have seen how our society is so much into uh, the physical etheric well-being, whether it's supplements, whether it's exercise, diet, sunshine, exercise, you know, all this exposure to a healthy way of living. That is the path of purification. On the astral plane, well, we know the, the well-known dualities and it's constantly fought upon the astral plane. There is the Kama Manas, which is mind and uh, or does, you know the, the mental and the desire, the astral. So there's always that uh, polarity to to deal with till eventually um, the mind is separate from the emotions. But all the dualities that we're so familiar with are all on the astral plane. That's where our glamours are. And on the mental plane, it's it's fought on the path of the. Uh, initiation so one has to already have had their first initiation which is the control and the balance of the physical etheric vehicle and then um, you are considered being a disciple i guess uh, so the the two contrasting forces which we will get into in more detail a little bit further on is the angel of the presence which in all um, for our intents and purposes we can call it the soul and the dweller on the threshold which we can call the sum total of the entire personality they are brought together face to face and the final conflict takes place the final conflict is not until the fourth initiation where the uh, causal body is uh, destroyed because it cannot any longer hold the amount of light and radiance in this confined 
I believe it or not, it is a form, the causal body. It's a body in this confined form, like the walls hold it in till eventually the, the uh, vibration is so strong that it causes it to erupt and to, uh, to, to, to just break apart. And the life within then can shine and the personality is absorbed into all of that. Anyway, that's a whole other study. We're not going to go into too much of that, but we will give you a little bit more information. So, uh, on the physical plane, the etheric is brought into conflict with the lowest aspect of the dense physical. So here you have the battle of the lower pair of opposites, which take place uh, and have to do with our physical disciplines. Um, so uh, on the more coarse level, it's abstinence, it's celibacy, it's it's um, physical hygiene, which you know, we tend to have a pretty good handle on most of this. Vegetarianism is important in certain uh, initiations. They talk about vegetarianism, and yet in other initiations, it's not that necessary anymore because you have control of that particular body. Um, now, the question is, what has this got to do with astrology, right? We're talking here about a general uh, opposition here on the physical plane. If you were to look at your astrology, what planet do you think you would look at to represent your physical and etheric? We didn't discuss this with you guys. I want you to really think this out. I'm going to tell you the answer anyway, but think about it. <laughs> so one of the things is the moon. The moon, although it does represent our emotions and the lines of least resistance, it is also known as the mother of form. It has to do with our form, our uh, body, our physical form. And um, one of the things that I would recommend that you do is look to see in what sign that moon is in and how does that affect your physical form. Uh, I know for me, as an example, my moon is in Capricorn and Capricorn has to do with hardness, right? Mountain. I have a tremendous amount of energy and will and drive within my physical form. Okay. And I'm generally very healthy. So that is me. But if you have it, let's say in, in a water sign, or if you have it in a fire sign, it would take on a totally different a way of being in the world. So look at your moon in terms of your physical form. And for the etheric, the etheric is, um, it's the earth, which is always opposite the sun. So look to see where the uh, earth is in your chart as well and see uh, where uh, that vitality, that etheric might be. For me, it's an Aries opposite my sun in Libra and Aries is fire. So I tend to have a lot of energy, Aries, in my uh, physical form given you a lot of information here and I've made it very personal so that you can identify with what I am saying here. Okay, let's move on. Okay, hold on just one second. You have a question. Sure. Um, go ahead, please, Nicole, you're self-muted. Nicole, did you have a question? You're self-muted. We can't hear you. Your hand is up. Well, I okay. Her hand just we'll went on. down, but yeah, maybe okay. she'll write, maybe she'll write a question, or maybe it was a mistake. Okay, okay. all right. We're going to move on to the astral duality. Um, it's it's the primary plane of duality. This is where the opposites, the constant interplay of the opposites, um, plus the uh, release. Uh, this is where the energies are released by the individual. How do we mean that? Well, you know, if you walk into a room and someone has had a, an argument with somebody else, the energy in the room is very, very uh, electrical. It's, it, it, it's staccato. You feel, you can feel that energy that has been released, right? It's the same thing if it's a very loving environment. The energy is totally welcoming and it feels totally different. It's all about our feelings and how they impact upon us. Um, yeah, and what 
where would you look for that in your chart? Where would you look for that astral component in your chart? Well, we've talked about the moon, so we'll leave the moon aside because uh, right now we're kind of labeling that to be the mother of form, which has to do with your 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 body, your 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 physical form. The the astral is ruled by Mars, fiery red Mars. As a matter of fact, it rules the solar plexus, and that's where our emotions are expressed. There is a higher component. There is a two areas to the solar plexus. The uh, average person, all of us, you know, relate to our uh, emotions, our feelings, our expression, and that would be the Mars energy. The higher is Neptune, and Neptune is where you know you feel so much love and compassion, compassion that it moves you to tears. See, tears are a sign of the higher emotions. Uh, so it's it's very subtle those higher emotions, uh, but they are they are still part of the solar plexus as in, as the energies move up towards the heart. But for the our, for intents and purposes right now for the astral plane for understanding our uh, dualities within the astral plane, I would really look to see where the Mars is for you. Okay, now my Mars happens to be in Cancer. Cancer holds things in. Cancer protects. So there's some kind of a shell I create about myself, so I'm not easily injured uh, emotionally. I'm not uh, one that mm, I can pretty well control control my emotions. So all a, a lot of that has to do with where your Mars is in your chart. Okay, we'll move on. So the most obvious one that most of our uh, readings and our teachings talk about is the soul versus the personality. And it says here, as the violence of the personality life grows, because the soul increasingly, the recipient of the best of the aspiring personality has to offer, it can't help but create a battle, a battle, the battle within oneself. Which way do I move? Do I move to the to the most uh, uh, lines of least resistance, which is our personality shtick and our personality behaviors, or do I try to bring in the soul? There's constantly this battle between the two, uh, uh, and that which has. Uh, been slowly turning its attention towards the mind of the personality. So we're starting to bring mind into all of this, the mental vehicle, because the mind is more than just the mental. The mind is the mental plus as much consciousness as one has developed. It's a combination of the two. Um, also, become, we become uh, aware of the opposing factor to true soul expression in our life. Um, how many of us really understand what the true soul expression is? How many of us have actually experienced soul expression? Uh, this is this is the battle. How is is there just a tinge of that? Is there an admixture of personality and soul, which usually is the case, and that's why it's the soul infusing, not an infused personality, but infusing the personality. Um, then the battle of the higher pairs of opposites begin between the soul and the personality. And it's, you see, you see, we're using war words here. It's consciously waged on both sides because there is a battle there. There is a war between the, the personality and the soul. Right now, the word war is a very popular word. So maybe it's not the best choice of words, but it's what the Tibetan uses. It's this learning to, to, to walk the middle, the middle way between the two great lines of force, another Libran uh, adage. Okay, and there you go. That's how you would look at your own chart, the sun sign versus the rising sign. And we'll go into much greater detail on that as we move along. But that's, these are the pairs of opposites we need to find a balance between in our daily life. And yes, the chart helps. And yes, looking at these planets in our chart helps us, but we've got to apply ourselves, apply ourselves to what we understand and know. Okay. So when the energies of the sun sign 
and the planets, the planets that have to do with our personality, in other words, the rulers that affect our personality, the exoteric rulers, are perfectly directed and adjusted, then the pairs of opposites are astrally regulated. When the energies of the sun and the rising sign are blended, so that you have a, quite a, a, a soul-infused per, uh, uh, person, um, then the opposites are mentally regulated. And then, of course, another point of crisis emerges. What do we mean by that? One of the things that uh, DK tells us is that, and, and this comes out in the Aclary um, formula that he has given us um, that has to do with alignment, crisis, um, revelation, and integration. Isn't it? Light. Is it? light. I love yeah. that line. Integration. Yeah in light right yeah yeah so the, the, all i'm trying to say is that every time we reach a point where we've got it together we are then exposed to another opportunity to see have we actually learned it we get another opportunity to to work out our our life work out our problems um and it's very saturnian really when you think about it saturn keeps us within our ring pass knot and as soon as we have kind of learned uh, our, our lesson, then that ring can expand, but then we could test it all over again to see if we've got it, truly got it. So that's what we mean that the, uh, the another point of crisis emerge. You blend it, you got it together, you've, you're, you're on a good aligned area, and then you have again another opportunity to be tested. Okay. Um, on the mental level, so on the mental level, it's the, uh, um, the DK tells us that only the disciple can act upon the mental level of consciousness at this point. Uh, once he does, then the die is really cast. He either moves forward towards the door of light where the master takes his hand, or he drops back temporarily into the life of the lower man where there's glamour and maya and all of that comes to the fore. This is where we, you know, the dweller of the threshold inserts himself between the disciple and the light from the open door. So the dweller being the sum total of all our personality behaviors, all the shtick, all the characteristics, all the shadows, all the imperfections, all the glamours. So this is, this is where the battle is eventually as we are disciples, our, most of the battle is on the mental plane. And this is where soul dwells, is it not? The soul dwells upon the mental plane. And um, it's, it's, one, it's on one of the subplanes of the mental plane. So the soul um, can be reached via the mind. We know that. Sure, it touches the astral. But to truly become an occultist or an esotericist, you need to develop the mind. And that's why our occult meditations are so, so vital to develop the uh, ability to have control of, the, uh, of all the various planes we find ourselves in. So here we go, a little talk about the uh, angel and the dweller. They do face each other. Um, the door stands open wide at the third initiation and eventually the light of the personal self fades and the glory of the angel is what dominates. So there's so much in the various biblical uh, um, words that are sp spoken of this particular uh, encounter. Um, and um, it is it is something that we may or may not be facing at this point in our life, but we certainly are seeing this right now in humanity, dealing with the, 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 the dweller and dealing a little bit with the angel as well. Uh, our circumstances in our life now has forced, uh, forced us to see the difference between the two. So as we move on to the next slide, where we talk a little bit more about the dweller, the dweller is the sum total of all characters, even the good. It's everything that we are identified with and as. It's the whole personality prior to redemption, uh, to union with the soul. Um, 
it represents all the past experiences, the inherited glamours, the wrong mental attitudes, and the sum total of all is all and all of that is represented in the dweller on the threshold. So it takes in, as I said earlier, the shadows, the glamours, all the negative, the vices, all the negative stuff that we have. It is a great impediment that blocks the door of initiation. Why? Because for so many, it is our identity. And as long as we're still identified with all of that, it's very hard to totally step into the light. There's also individual racial, national, planetary dwellers. The confrontation of the angel and the dweller is reenacted at multiple levels. And right now, as I said, we are actually meeting that, are we not? And it is only the light of the soul, the light and the love and the will of the soul that eventually redeems the dweller. That's why we talk about that infusion of the light into the personality. The more light that is infused, the more soul that is infused, the more we learn to change. We learn to, to address those glamours, to address our shadows, to address our vices and tur turn them into virtues. And it's, it's even beyond character building. Okay, so the angel of the presence, it distributes solar fire, and uh, it is also known as the solar angel or the soul. And in each initiation, the dweller faces the angel of the presence. So you can see that this is an incremental kind of uh, perfection. The, each initiation allows us to face that angel, to get rid of some of the uh, uh, characteristics of the dweller, to get rid of some of the negativity. As, as we said, in the first initiation, you're getting rid of all the physical things that hold you back. Uh, lic uh, licentiousness, did I say that correctly? It's a mouthful. Um, you know, uh, the addictions to all these different things, whether it be food, whether it be alcohol, whether it, whatever it is, it has to do with the physical form. On the astral, you get you, st you start to learn to get rid of some of the glamours that we have. And on the mental, which is the third initiation, you get rid of some of the illusions that we have, some of our belief systems, some of our identifications that we have been, um, uh, have been in incul incul inculcated to into for so long. So does the angel kill the dweller? No, even though many of the books say kill out the personality. It doesn't kill the dweller. It embraces it as a character of redemp a, a part of the redemption process. And the dweller is conquered when the soul light consumes and obliterates the light of matter. Uh, this beautiful picture of the angel of the presence is by Francis Donald. He's done some really, really good work and we have his permission to use this. So there you go. And I think that moves it over to you. I think it uh, Yes, it does. And number one, we have a question here. Sure. Um, but before I get to that question, I also wanna say that for those of you who participate in the Glamour uh, webinars with Michael Robbins, uh, he's been talking for a month or so on the dweller and the angel. And he's got some really good information in there that uh, basically comes from uh, the book Glamour World Problem. Um, there's about 10 pages that start somewhere in the neighborhood of 154 and move forward talking about it. And, and Michael has discussed that um, right. quite, quite a bit. So if you haven't, if you do participate, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't participated in the Glamour webinars, you may want to just check those out. Okay. Right. There's, even in, in Glamour World Problem on the page 126, I have references to that as well on the dwellers. So throughout the book, he sprinkles a lot of information about this, but what you've uh, identified at the pages is a little bit more concentrated. Yeah, page right. 154 to 160. Okay. And we, uh, we've got a couple of questions now. Um, okay. 
Yvonne says, what about addictions to cell phones and TV? Well, honey, you can't, you can't take them with you. So that's my, uh, what is it? My litmus test. Um. <laughs> well, you know, cell phone and TV is a lot more than the physical, physical body. It's the entire personality, you know. Um, you know, I, I, this, this is a whole new area. I, I don't have too much to say about it, except that we have to learn controls over that, don't we? Um, you know, I, I see that in the teenagers. I, I, I just, I just see that all around me, and you know, it, it's a whole new piece for for most of these um, young kids not to have it as an extra limb. You know? Right. And then the next question is from Suzanne. She says, "I feel at some point." The dwellers' hardest lessons have to do with the choosing between the levels of one's known and experienced good and some of our most cherished illusions. Oh, yeah. I mean, those illusions are so, so difficult to, to recognize. That's, you know, that's the whole thing. We don't even recognize our illusions. We assume that they are actual and factual. And so... Let someone else tell you that that's an illusion and you'll, you know, we tend to fight that because we have such belief in them. So it, it's definitely um, a, a battleground. And that's why the third initiation is such a difficult one to reach. Okay, I'm going to okay. make now. Okay, so we're covering, um, you know, a, a review and... Um, you know, we've addressed this before, but I wanted to talk about it again um, because we've covered all um, 12 of the signs, all six of the pairs of opposites, as well as the other pairs of opposites that we see in the chart, the sun-earth axis, the ascendant-descendant axis, the uh, mid-heaven nadir axis, any uh, polarities that fall within your planets, all of that is important. But remember when we're talking about the signs that they're actually that a dynamic part of a cross. So we need to look at the entire cross as a whole and how the two axes involved actually challenge each other until the full nature of the cross begins to work. You know, there's some place, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the reference, where DK says that ultimately we get to the point where we stand in the middle at the hub of the cross and wield the four arms as we need them. And eventually we get to the middle of the horoscope and we wield the 12 arms as we need to because we have complete control. But are we there yet? Heck no, we are not there yet. Now, hold on just a minute. We've got another question. Does Lilith fit into the astral glamours? Yes, there are a lot of uh, points, um, uh, asteroids, uh, black moons, you know, et cetera, that all fit into, into that. We don't specifically address Lilith in our work here because you just can't address everything. But yes, all of that fits into the astral glamours. Thank you for asking. Okay, so um, we want to consider the entire cross and how the axes challenge each other until the nature of the cross begins to work. So. We're going to do that by looking at um, the three crosses again. Um, I also want to point out when we're talking about these crosses, there's two completely different contexts of this, okay? Um, we're actually talking about the modes of activity, how we predominantly work. Um, as expressed through the three crosses. Of course, the three crosses can also represent our point in evolution, but that is not what we're talking about here. Okay, so here we go. The cardinal cross, these signs are initiating exoterically. It can be forceful, important, it has will, it has drive, it has action, it has ambition, but 
these folks may lack follow through if they don't have anything in there that is going to give them that stick to itness. Lots of ideas, but not necessarily the follow through that go along with it. So initiating Aries initiates action and Libra initiates relationships. Cancer initiates feelings and Capricorn initiates accomplishment. Esoterically, the Cardinal Cross um, expresses that directed, soul-centered activity through the nature of the third and the seventh rays. As we see here, the third ray, Cancer, Capricorn, and Libra. The seventh ray, Cancer, Capricorn, and Aries. Makes a nice little cross there, doesn't it? Oops, I have too many computers here. Fixed cross. These are stabilizing for us. Exoterically, it can be steadfast, stubborn, determined. It expresses desire. This is where you get your endurance. But as my husband tells me all the time, we can tend to be inflexible. So Taurus stabilizes accomplishments. Scorpio stabilizes feelings. See the pattern here? Leo stabilizes action and Aquarius stabilizes relationships. Esoterically, the activity of the fixed cross involves soul development through crises and tests via the fourth and fifth rays. Now, we saw just a minute ago that neat little cross there, right? Where the heck is that neat little cross here? It isn't, right? The ray, oops, I have this wrong. The ray um, four is the Taurus Scorpio axis plus Sagittarius. So this should say ray four right here, okay? And the ray five is the Leo Aquarius axis plus Sagittarius. So they don't look pretty because they don't play as well together as the other two do. Um, and this is one of the natures of this fixed cross. This is the cross of the disciple. All those tests, all those trials, all those fail, 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 but you will always have an opportunity to try again. This is what um, Hercules went through. He was on the fixed cross. And so all of his labors, you know, very few of them are, hey, you did real good. Most of them are, why did you do that? You shouldn't have um, killed Hippolyta. Um, you shouldn't have, um, I forget all the, all the things that he did that he shouldn't have done. He got completely um, off on tangents and under a false god in, in Gemini and um, it, many times he was told, um, you completed the task, but you did it badly, right? Well, that's the nature of this particular cross. Can I add one more thing here before you move on? It's interesting that the two rays that you've uh, identified for this cross are the fourth ray, which is the ray of humanity, and the fifth ray, which is the ray of the mind. And we need to move into that more and more and more. So I, I think that that is why this fixed cross is the is the cross of discipleship. It's the cross, that, you know, it's smack, uh, you know, where we as 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 a as disciples and people on on the path are in. Oh, did I didn't say that well, but you know what I mean. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. And and that's the one thing they share in common is that Sagittarius, right? I see the goal, I reach the goal, and then I see another. Okay, and then the mutable cross. Again, it's really nice and neat and pristine here with the ray two and the ray six, isn't it? So... The mutable cross teaches us to adjust things. Exoterically, it's adaptable and versatile, active, flexible, changeable. 
but it can also be too inconsistent. Gemini adjusts relationships. Sagittarius adjusts actions. Virgo adjusts accomplishments and Pisces adjusts feelings. Esoterically, it helps to develop the form life via multiple incarnations. Experience life in all its aspects as we develop the second and the sixth rays. So it's try, try, and try again as we learn through the mutable cross. Okay, so that's our review. But what are we going to do with it? How do we put it all together? What does it mean to each of us? And how do we apply what we've learned about the uh, addressing the opposites in our daily life? Uh, let me just quickly go over both of our charts here. Okay, this is Eva's chart and it's the sun veiling some kind of a planet as an expression of the personality, right? So what is the sun veiling here as an expression of her personality? It could be Neptune, the heart of the sun, right? Her Neptune is loosely conjunct um, her sun there in Libra. I mean, basically they're both in the same sign. It's not a close conjunction, but it doesn't have to be. The fact that they're both there in Libra gives it a relationship that they can work together with. So that's a good possibility. It could also be Uranus in Gemini, the occult mind. And it's Uranus is trying her son. And Uranus is also the esoteric ruler of Libra. So there's connections there as well. What could that mean? Unlocking the secrets of the occult mind, right? And why do I say unlocking? Because Gemini for her, it's intercepted in her 12th house, isn't it? So she's going to have trouble expressing this until she can unlock it. So that's a, a possible um, veiling for her. Mine. Neptune in Libra is what I believe my son is veiling, that I'm learning to open up to the heart of the sun. My son is actually quintile Neptune, which is a favorable relationship between them, indicating that I've worked on that in prior lives. Now, could Uranus could also be veiling it, Uranus in Cancer, but I have no aspects between the Sun and Uranus. So, if it is veiling them, then I need to establish some kind of contact. Now, Uranus is conjunct Mercury, who is the exoteric ruler of my chart. And of course, the Sun represents the personality or the exoteric expression. So Mercury could be there helping to build a bridge between Uranus um, and my sun personality and the ascendant and my emerging soul purpose, but that's a reach. I mean, you can look and you can find connections if you look hard enough, but I'm going to stick with, I think, because of the quintile relationship that my son is veiling Neptune as an expression of my personality. Right, wrong or indifferent, that's my best guess right now. Yeah, go Biel, ahead. Biel, can you explain to our listeners why we are working with Neptune and Uranus? Yes, um, there's several planets. I, I mean, the moon and the sun at various points points are said to be veiling a planet and the usual suspects are going to be Vulcan, Neptune, and Uranus, um, which are the transcendental planets. Now Vulcan primarily, um, not always, but primarily with the moon and with the form, um, but with the sun, um, the two best suspects 
are Neptune and Uranus. Okay, no questions on that before I move on. So that's just a quick gist of what's going on here, all right? And that's just the personality. I see a hand up somewhere. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Yvonne, you're self-muted. There you okay. go. Uh, I just have a question, Bia. I thought that your Neptune, your Vulcan here is what, 24 degrees Leo. I thought Vulcan always had to be within eight or 10 degrees of Mercury. No, eight or 10 degrees of the sun. Of the sun? Yes, okay. and we, you know, we include Vulcan because we talk about it, but this is a hypothetical placement within the chart. You know, it could be, I can tell you it's, mine is going to be in Leo because eight degrees either way of my sun, it's still going to be in Leo. It's, um, it's inside the orbit of Mercury. So it's the closest planet to the sun. And that's why it can't be, um, from our perspective, uh, any further than eight degrees. And, and yes, they are now, uh, there's certain schools of thought that say it could be as far as 10 degrees, but. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, Now, we're going to get on and we're going to talk about the soul purpose and destiny. Um, the rising sign with the esoteric planetary rulers indicates the soul purpose and it points the way to the future, um, offering us an opportunity for this lifetime. So DK tells us that the horoscope built up around the rising sign considering the esoteric planet rulers is going to convey the destiny of the disciple. And um, the disciple is going to be responding to the influences of the 12 arms of the three crosses as they pour their influences through the esoteric planet uh, planetary rulers via the 12 houses. In other words, it's all part of the makeup of what our natal chart is, you know, what the signs are on the cusp, um, who the esoteric rulers are for um, the particular signs, and, uh, you know, how it all works together and merges together. Um, now, purpose is the intended or desired result. It's something to be accomplished this lifetime. That's our purpose for incarnating. Destiny, on the other hand, is a predetermined course of events. So, um, you know, who determines the course of events? Somebody else does. You know, we just get battered around in it. We get battered around more personality-wise, especially if we're not on track with what we plan to do this lifetime. I mean, you know, the, the outer planets come through and they transit um, and they ping off of our natal chart at various different times. Um, and I always like to think of it as um, if it seems like a great opportunity and we take advantage of it and we um, we learn and we move on, um, we gain something from the transit, then I think of the soul as um, taking advantage of that opportunity that came around. If it seems like it's blindsiding us and it seems like it's turning our life upside down and it pushes us in a direction that we weren't necessarily willing to go, then I think of it more as a personality issue where we had gone astray. And as the planets moved into position to be opportunities that we had hoped they would be, we weren't ready at that point to take advantage of the opportunity. So it nudged us along. Right, wrong, or indifferent, that's the way I've always looked at it. 
So let's look a little closer here at the distinction between the sole purpose and the destiny of the disciple. Um, Oops. That purpose arises from the soul and the destiny is worked out upon the physical plane according to the purpose. Destiny is the creative freedom that the soul has to work out its purpose. It may only be an approximation thereof. Destiny is therefore worked out in the areas of life experience, which are what? They're the houses in our chart, right? The disciple responding to the esoteric planetary rulers via those 12 houses is what that quote from DK said that we looked at a minute ago. Therefore, the esoteric rulers of the cross of the rising sign. We're not just talking about the ascendant here. We're talking about the entire cross of the rising sign and all of the esoteric rulers, their aspects to each other, their house placement, uh, placement that's going to help us indicate the destiny. So the ascendant plus any prominent planet that's conjunct or there in the first house, the esoteric ruler of the ascendant by sign, by house and conjunction to other planets, if any, the esoteric ruler of the sign on the cusp of the house containing the ascendant esoteric ruler. A lot of different pieces here, right? But they all give us a little tiny clue as to what's going on. Do they play well together via their aspects or, or don't they? Okay, Eva, over to you for these three. Okay, thank you very much. So we're going to use ourselves as an example of how we've gone around uh, trying to understand what the Tibetan has given us. So here we're going to try to determine my sole purpose. And so what he basically has said is that the, it's the sign of the ascendant, so that's cancer, plus any prominent planets conjunct or within the first house. This particular house system gives me Mars. I've had other house systems where it's both Mars and Saturn, but let's work with just Mars. Mars in the first house is something I have to consider. Next thing is the esoteric ruler of the ascendant, which is Neptune, by sign, it's in Libra, by house, it's in the fifth house, and conjunct anything, it's conjuncting it's conjuncting actually the whole thing, but it's conjuncting Jupiter as the most um, direct uh, and closest conjunction uh, together with um, um, Chiron. So what we have to try to put all of that together. The next thing is that the esoteric ruler of the sign on the cusp of the house, which contains the ascendant esoteric ruler. Whew. The ascendant esoteric ruler uh, we know is Neptune. The house on the cusp is Libra. And the esoteric ruler of that is Uranus, which is up here in the 12th house. So I've got to think about Mars. I've got to think about um, Neptune and Jupiter. And I've got to think about Uranus and how all of that plays out. I just very quickly put down here what I think my purpose is because let's face it all of this has to do with the ascendant and the ascendant as we have said is is one of the most important things that we look for and that's why the 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 date is important and the time is important so in cancer i feel like my purpose is offering the ageless wisdom to the family of man that's cancer and with determination and with mind now i'm sure that there's so much more that i could uh, elaborate on i chose mine because i have all that libra air stuff i have uranus which is in gemini more air so i keep you know looking at 
a mental approach to the way in which I would offer the ageless wisdom. In other words, as a teacher, I feel part of that is my purpose is to is to relay, to offer, to to make it teachable, and to really come up with ways and ideas in which this can be done. Kind of makes sense. I hope so. But that's for the time being what I've come up with. This is very um, soul searching, and I, you know, we invite all of you to go through this process because it's not, it ain't easy, as they say. Okay. Oh. Ah, the destiny. That's me again. <laughs> the esoteric rulers of the rising sign cross. So the rising sign cross is the cardinal cross for me. It's, it's not always the same as what the sun sign is. In this particular case, they're all related. It's all the same. So what are the esoteric rulers? So for uh, Cancer, it is Neptune. For Libra, which is uh, right here, down here, it is Uranus. For Capricorn, which is the descendant, it is Saturn. And for Aries, which is at the ascent, at the top of the chart there, it is um, Mercury. So Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, and Mercury. Uh, I've only included some of these um, aspects. There are more, but let's just deal with the most obvious ones. Neptune, is the first one and it squares the moon. So um, I have to be very careful with uh, how I talk about it. Sure, it's, em it's emotional nature becoming more refined with sensitivity to booty, which is Neptune and deeply empathetic. But there's a tendency to do what we call spiritual bypass. I can keep it all very high. But I want to get into the nitty gritty, how I live my life on a regular everyday basis. So um, the moon, as we have said, is the mother of form. The moon represents my physical form. And Neptune is one's sensitivities. I have a lot of sensitivities to my body, like a lot of them. I can't handle um, hot or cold weather. I, you know, I, I end up with all kinds of problems. My skin is sensitive. I'm sensitive etherically to the uh, environment, to the way things are. So there's a lot of physical body sensitivities here as well. So moon squaring um, the Neptune, sure, it's, it's wonderful to think in terms of sensitivity to booty, but I wanted to make it much more real. Uh, Neptune quintiles Saturn. So Saturn is in the second house, Neptune is in, in the fifth house here. So there's a quintile and a quintile, I know we haven't really covered all that with all of you. It has to do with, um, Quinn has to do with five, I think, and it has to do with uh, a positive. It's a positive relationship. It is something that we call a talent or something we brought back from the past and it's an ease for us. So uh, one of the ways um, to interpret that for me is realism and boundaries over illusions sensitivities and dreaminess because of Saturn. See, Neptune can be, as you know, very dreamy, very um, foggy, very unrealistic. And Saturn comes in there and makes it much more real and much and creates the boundaries rather than being uh, um, lost in the um, dreams or lost in the waters. Um, Neptune squares the ascendant and Neptune is the esoteric ruler of the ascendant. So now this one, we went with something a little higher. Opportunity for Buddhic refinement. Um, Mercury, Mercury, which is right down here also in Libra, Mercury squares Saturn. So now that is not cut and dry. Uh, Saturn, as we know, has to do with structure. So it could be structure in the mind. But on the downside of that, it's the lack of flow in word expression, which I've been so aware of most of my life. Um, the, I, I see how words just don't flow in easily for me and I have to stop and think about it. And, and so I know that there is a Saturnian, Saturn Mercury for me there creates a, a bit of a challenge. So that's how I, I'm interpreting these um, these things here. I mean, I have, one could say I have Mercury um, 
and the sun, you know, uh, conjuncting one another. So I could have, um, you know, mercurial insights, things like that. I mean, we could go on and on with more relationships here. I could have taken that whole uh, stellium and talked about that with Neptune there. But this just gives you an idea of the way in which um, we've gone about, I've gone about uh, working with that. Uh, Uranus, did I talk at all about Uranus? I don't think I did. Let's just go back for one minute. Uranus, Uranus, um, Uranus trines the sun. So that could be an occult kind of a relationship here, the mind, which is when it's unlocked, and it did take a long time to unlock that. It could be, you know, uh, an occult mind. Uranus also squares Venus. Uranus and Venus are squared. And Venus is also the mind. So it could be information in the mind or um, um, ideas, you know, ideas popping into the mind. So there's, you know, we can play around with various interpretations, but there you go. And is there another one I have, I, I, I deal with now? I th or yeah, the problems. <laughs> okay, the problem of the disciple. <laughs> DK tells us, when the sun sign with its exoteric rulers is worked out in a chart, the rising sign with its esoteric rulers is worked out, and the two are superimposed upon each other, that will give us the problem of the disciple in any particular incarnation. And note that he, he says rulers, it's plural, which indicates that it's the rulers of the entire cross. Uh, sun ascendant that the sun and the ascendant are on for some people it's not always the same cross as it happens to be for me because for me it's the cardinal cross so some people have to play with more than one cross so the exoteric ruler of the cardinal cross of the libra sun are venus it's it's the um it's the out is, is that the outer one you did yeah the, uh, yeah, it's the outer wheel. Yeah, Venus for Libra, Saturn for Capricorn, Mars for Aries, and the Moon for Cancer. Um, esoterically, we will look at the rulers of the same cross, and they are Neptune for um, Cancer, Uranus for Libra, Saturn again for Capricorn and Mercury, the esoteric ruler of Aries. And I don't know if there are other ways to look at coming up with the, the problem, but it looks to me like in both uh, rulers, Saturn is repeated a couple of times. So Saturn is, the, is common to both sets of rulers. And so I think it's something I, needed, I need to address. Um, so Saturn is conjunct Mars, and it also squares the Sun, and so and it sextiles uh, squares Mercury, squares the Sun, and sextiles Venus. So I, I was looking at this and thinking about it, and in what way do I have a problem in the world? And I think a lot of it has to do with Mars and Saturn together. Um, it, this was told to me a long time ago that this is a really difficult combination, you know. It's karmic and it's difficult. And I did not understand that. And I thought about it and thought about it. Well, hence, I think I have been able to articulate what that might be. So we think of Mars. Mars is fiery. It is hot. It is, yes, it is the gas pedal. It is one's assertion one's direction and it can be ruthless it is also aggression aggression and that which motivates us so what does it do it comes up against saturn which is the break so you have acceleration and the break at the same time so the break is this is our limitation saturn my limitation saturn so it's the hard work i need to do to get to where it is i want to go so the heat and the passion and the fiery enthusiasm hits a wall, hits the, the law, hits a wall. How much heat should be applied? 
this is something I deal with all the time. Um, how much, how hard do I want to work to get to where I where I need to go? You see, so uh, I don't need authority to tell me. I have authority. Authority is Saturn. It is the law. This is as far as you can go. So it's the kind of battle that I've had to live with most of my life. And I do think that that is part of my problem. And of course, all of that squares my son. So it's my whole personality that has to deal with that, has to deal with the push and pull, uh, push and stop, really. It's, it's not pull, it's push and stop, push and stop um, most, of, most of my existence. So that's what I think is, 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 the, is the problem I experience. I think that's it for now. Okay, I just wanted to point out that um, when we look at Eva's, um, you know, the, the exoteric wheel here and the esoteric wheel here, and we see these, um, this T-square, which is basically um, the same T-square, it shows that her personality and her soul have kind of a common goal, right? The personality has that Mars, where's my little cursor here? Okay, that Mars um, gas pedal and Saturn, the break right there together. But on her esoteric one, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for her to work with the personality, which is addressed in both of them, the sun earth axis there, um, to work with that and, and elevate it towards the soul mm -hmm. purpose. So see how closely aligned they are there. I, I just wanted to point that out. All right. Mm -hmm. And now we get to look at the same thing through my chart. Okay. So we're looking at my, um, my soul purpose. Um, my ascendant is Gemini, but I have nothing else in my first house unless you use another house method and then you can put Jupiter there and that's why I have a weight problem. Oh, wait a minute. No, that's not the subject of this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what's Gemini about? Gemini is about spreading the word. It's about learning to discern the real from the unreal, right? It's also about learning to be of service. I just love the nature of the service that um, was brought out in, in that uh, Gemini labor. Um, and I think, I, I hope you guys can't hear that. My weather radio is going off. Um, that seems to be a key point for me is that that service aspect. Okay. Um, so, you know, Hercules was actually um, trapped by that false guru. He didn't listen to his inner guide. And eventually he found himself torn between finally keeping on the path, the straight and narrow, or stopping to help first Prometheus and then Atlas. And in both cases, he stopped to help Prometheus and then Atlas. And that resulted in the apples actually being given to him. Because in this labor, he's told that service to others never delays us on our path. And I, that just really resonated with me. Um, I, I think I've got a strong service component. I could spend hours telling you about my strong service component, but let's move on. Okay. So the esoteric ruler of my ascendant is Venus in Virgo in the fourth house. Little old Venus in Virgo in the fourth house. She is not conjunct anything. That's okay because she's aspecting quite a number of things. But I think of Venus in Virgo in my fourth house as being a discerning and an analytical mind. I think I have a Ray 5 uh, mental vehicle. And that matches very closely with my discerning analytical Venus there in the fourth house. It's better than some of the mundane stuff about Venus and Virgo that say she's totally um, 
passionless and um, as, as one guy told me, you know, if my husband brought home the Kama Sutra, I would be reading it, not practicing. No, never mind. Um, so the esoteric ruler of Virgo is the moon, right? And it could be Valine, Vulcan or Neptune. The age old question, what is the moon veiling? So one way of looking at this is that I'm learning to act as a go between the higher and the lower using the precision of Venus in Virgo to express balance and harmony. We can also look at it's the ability to teach this to others because remember it's still she's the esoteric ruler of my ascendant. So it's still related. It's all about my little Gemini puppy here, right? Um, the moon could be veiling Vulcan, maybe to forge the tools necessary for me to do the work that I need to do. But my moon is also loosely conjunct Neptune. And actually, when you talk about the luminaries, you basically say 10 degrees. So the moon, the sun, or the ascendant are, you know, you go wide. But again, even in the same sign, it shows a relationship. But what this tells me is that the moon could also be veiling Neptune for me, which would then connect my personality, sun veiling Neptune, remember, um, the mortal twin, and my soul purpose, the moon veiling Neptune, as the immortal twin, right? Tying it back again to Gemini. So, um, and as I've mentioned before, um, I've also looked at this as my Ray 2 Gemini soul focused through that Ray 5 Venus analytical uh, mental vehicle. So there's a number of different connections here and different ways to look at it on any given day. I can look at my chart and say, hmm, I wonder if that means this, or I wonder if that means that. And that's one of the reasons that you really want to understand uh, exoteric astrology as well as esoteric. So you see all these um, little connections within connections within connections. Okay, so now we're doing the whole cross. So for me, this is the mutable cross. So Venus is the esoteric ruler of Gemini. Vulcan and Neptune are the esoteric ruler of Virgo. The Earth is the esoteric ruler of Sagittarius and Pluto is the esoteric ruler of Pisces. So all of those have to play in. And like Eva, you know, we could sit here and talk about aspects and I'd have 10 slides because all of my little babies here are all at 22 to 24 degrees. So they all talk to each other and they all aspect each other in a number of different ways. But let's look at the big ones. Venus square the ascendant as the ruler of my chart, right? So I'm looking at that as I'm refining my soul approach to right human relations. Venus is square Mars. Venus down here, Mars over here. Refining emotions and finding the balance between forcefulness, little old Mars here, and softness, little old Venus. My Earth is quincunx the moon. My Earth, where is it? Right over here, 11 Aquarius. Is it quincunx the moon? One, two, three, four. Yes, it is. No. Five, five signs. One, two, three, four, five. Five signs. Four signs. It's trine. They're both air. Uh-huh. Okay. So there you go. <laughs> okay. Come on. <laughs> must, have been, must have been a long night. Okay. So the earth is um, trine the moon. Mm -hmm. So it, it it's that's a favorable aspect, the ability to stabilize 
those past patterns. Mm -hmm. It still works, whether it's quincunx or trine. Um, they're working together and they have an affinity for each other as a trine. All right, Neptune is quincunx the sun. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's quintile. Uh huh. It's quintile. Which is better. That's that, that, exactly. Exactly. That's that favorable, you know, the, um, it's the fifth harmony, the um, five pointed star um, is, is what the quintiles are. And that's something that I've worked on in a, in a past life um, that I brought forward a talent or a spiritual ability um, in that. So that I look at is dissolving and refocusing the personality at that higher spiral because the sun, of course, is the personality in Neptune. That's one of the things he does. He dissolves so that you can refocus it in a, in a, um, a, a newer light. Okay. Neptune is square Uranus. Yes, that's actually true. <laughs> <laughs> Learning to awaken the spiritual intuition. Okay, and the Sun, Vulcan, Pluto, they're all in Leo, um, developing that personal will to transform the inner self. You know, that's what we have to do. We have to overcome that selfish Leo personality, that in your face, it's my way or the highway, and develop the personal will to look yourself in the mirror and say, you, I'm working on you. I'm bringing you up to a higher standard. Pluto is trying Mars. Yes, sir, Bob, that one's true too. Pluto, Mars. I'm energetically helping others to dig deep through the astrology. Mars is my personal little action figure. And Pluto is the guy that digs deep and rips everything out from the roots and brings it to the light of day so that you can address it. So that's what I look at as possible destiny for the rulers of my rising sign cross. And then when we look at the problem of the disciples, um, this is my personality rulers and this is my esoteric rulers. And as you see, I don't have the neat little um, two of them working together like Eva did. Mine, one is the mutable cross and the other is the cardinal cross. Mm -hmm. So my, I just have to figure out which one is which. The, um, the green is the ruler of my chart, Venus squaring my ascendant descendant axis. Okay. Um, oh, I didn't, I didn't go through the rulers, but um, exoterically, the rulers of the fixed cross, which is my Leo sun, sun, Mars, Pluto, Uranus, and Venus, the esoteric rulers of the mutable cross, my rising sign, Venus, Moon, Valine, Vulcan, or Neptune, Earth, and Pluto. Um, the Sun Earth axis is in both of these crosses, uh, as is Venus. Venus is the chart ruler esoterically. Um, and Pluto, um, my midheaven in Pisces, Pluto's the ruler of that. And the missing point of my mutable cross um, is what? Right up here in my 10th house. It's um, Pisces. Pisces, it is. It, it's about 24 Pisces, give or take, um, there. And the missing point of my fixed cross, uh, my cardinal cross, is Aries over here. My part of fortune is kind of close, um, but I look at this more as a T square, not a, a fixed. Uh, you know, you add some of those asteroids in there, and there's a lot of them you could get the missing point, but uh, <laughs> I think of that as a T-square basically. So, um, so 
what I'm saying is there's connections within connections within connections. Mm -hmm. Venus, Mars, Pluto, Uranus, Neptune, they're all at that bingo for me, 23 to 25 degrees. So they all form relationships to in each other as they interact together as the rulers of this sun in the ascendant crosses. And that to me emphasizes the problem of little old disciple BL. They're working together. They're not necessarily playing well together, but they're working together. And any kind of relationship that's forged is important. You know, the, um, the squares are always going to be contentious until you learn to work uh, well with them. That's your test. That's your trials. Um, but those are our learning experiences. The favorable aspects, they're nice to have. But we just rest back on our laurels and we don't gain anything from them. They help us through the trials, but it's the trials that get us where we need to be, that uh, make us accomplish something. So, Bill, if you had to summarize, how would what would you say is your problem as a disciple? Um, my problem as a disciple is uh, working effectively with all of this and um, the emphasis for me with all of this and what I'm trying to do as a disciple is um, express the concept of right human relations and giving in service to my spiritual group and I'm trying to do that through the Morber Federation so that's I'm good at parts of it. I'm not good at other parts of it. And so that's what I'm trying to do is um, harmonize everything together in the manner that it should be befitting of a disciple. So um, we have a question here. Let me see. Um, you know, it's all, it's all cyclic you would be one of them Eva because mm. of all your Libra um, a lot of people are having difficulty with the COVID lockdowns because they're people people me no I'm the hermit I <laughs> love the lockdown <laughs> and actually it's not that much different than my life was before the lockdown but I'm just saying that's one of the problems of this disciple here is that the hermit and the mystic that we all are, um, you know, that we all learned to be a long time ago, has to uh, open up and become the group oriented occultist. So it's interesting that you say that. I, I mean, for the long, for the last five years, we've moved up to the country, so our life is very isolated and not too much excitement. As a matter of fact, it's rather boring. So it gives me more opportunity to read, to study. Um, yeah, so I, I, my life isn't that much different since COVID came around, except standing in lines to do grocery shopping. Yeah, so I'm, I'm okay with it. I guess I'm being trained to be more um, isolated for some reason, and uh, life circumstances is attributing to that. Well, it's a lesson for all of us in a number of different ways. I remember in my early years of marriage, I couldn't wait till we went out with other couples and we had friends and all that kind of stuff. None of that Libran stuff is important to me anymore at all. So, you know, we definitely change, we grow. Um, what I'm being trained for, I haven't got a clue, but something is happening. <laughs> well, that's what we have to say. You know, <laughs> um, we always have to be moving forward. I think you pointed this out in one of the earlier slides, you know, we uh, just make it through run crises and then we have another one. Yeah. Um, because it's always, it's, it's always moving forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in this whole series, we've covered a lot of important things about the various pairs of opposites. Now we've looked at the synergy of the chart not only through those axes, but also by looking at the full cross of the ascendant and the sun. So I hope that we've given you some food for thought here. 
Um, we have a question here. Oops, I guess we have a couple. Um, it's good to have a few computers in front of you. Yeah, I just have to remember which one I'm clicking on. <laughs> <laughs> this is really... Uh, BL, for, while, while you are looking at those, perhaps I can, can uh, suggest that uh, we talk about the tests that we face. And I suggest that the tests that we face are not the events and circumstances, but our reactions to them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. How we, how we, yeah, how we handle all our life circumstances. That's, that's what it's all about. I mean, the same circumstance can happen to two different people and each one will handle it differently. So it's our reaction to these circumstances. Agreed, 100%. Um, okay, thank you, Michael, for that. Um, we got a couple of hands, but let me let me get to the questions here. Um, Laura says, thank you for this beautiful series on the webinars. And for those of you who don't know, this is the eighth and the final one in the series. And we'll send a notice out. So if you haven't caught all of them, uh, please, please look them up. Um, let me see. I also wanted to mention an earlier comment made during the webinar uh, where I mentioned that DK talks about uh, standing at the center of the cross and moving um, in the forearms and later the 12 arms. And uh, Laura says this made me think of the Hindu image of gods who tend to be represented as having many rotating arms. Yes, exactly. I'm wondering if there might be a relationship between the advanced stages of evolution described by Master DK and the Hindu representation of the gods. I think there is. I am not by any means an expert on that. But yes, there's a number of reasons that they have multiple um, hands. So that's, a, I think, a good way of looking at it. Um, and I'm glad that you're enjoying um, this series. Uh, okay, Jan says, when we are missing one arm in a cross, does the influence set up with the larger transiting planets that occur in the empty space? Does it create a new type of opportunity? Um, <laughs> and she likes my terms of endearment for my chart placement. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> my Bobsy twins are that Mercury and Uranus, so they're always going to think something different. But Anyway, um, yes, you know, transiting planets are always going to set something up. You know, the moon transits your chart, uh, your entire chart, once a month. Um, the sun and all of its little retinue of the Mercury and Vulcan and, and Venus come through once a year. Um, Mars comes through every two years. Uh, Jupiter comes through every 12 years. Uh, Saturn comes through every 29-ish years. So you've always got something going on. There's always going to be something that's close there. And we not only look at transits, but we also look at um, progressions. So, you know, there's different kinds of progressions, but um, you've always got something going on, and those missing points to the T-squares are always going to have um, something come through and fulfill the cross. Sometimes it's going to be for a short time, like a couple of hours as the moon uh, blasts through, or uh, one day as the sun uh, goes through, or um, bless their pointed head. Those outer planets that are so much fun, <laughs> they stick around for a year as they do that little tap dance. You know, they move forward and then they move back and then they move forward. So they hit a point three times. Aren't we lucky? You know, it's like, did you get it? Did you understand what? Here, let's review. And then, all right, now I told you to act. So act. You know, that's the, the three step of the little tap dance of those outer planets. So, yeah, something is always going to be going on. Um, Yvonne says these slides will be available for us to study. Yes, they're in the chat box right now. For those of you who um, want to download them, the, they will also be um, with the recordings when we announce that. 
um, Helen says, is karma the aspect involved with the births that involve serious diseases of the body? Um, probably, I don't want to get into that so much. Um, but yeah, more than likely, um, there's karmic aspects. And part of that are group karmic aspects. You know, the whole family is going to be um, involved in mm -hmm. some of that. Um, and I tend to think with children with disabilities um, that it's more about the parental response that's needed and less about the child because a lot of the children don't realize they're different right. you know and they're such loving you know i'm thinking of little downs um, children you know they're such loving warm-hearted people um, and they don't realize that they're different really um, so um, yeah but there, there's a lot of different aspects that that get into the karma um, Karen, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and then is Yvonne, uh, I, yeah, I know I, I, I've got, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Can you go ahead yourself muted Yvonne? You had your hand up. Up again, you know, it, they look the opposite of what they really are. Um, let me see. Yeah, it's it's down. There. It's up again. You have something to say. Just put yourself out there and a read really into it the experience that you have of this forum. The mailing list where I tell you what the the uh, recognize most of your names and I know you're on the mailing list. I'm not sure about you, um, Yvonne. Are you on some of the Makara um, more Federation mailing lists? Uh, sub oh, okay, okay, good, good. Because um. <laughs> so just you <laughs> get back to the comments um a personality can do nothing for at this point factor in here is identical with the conflict which takes that he is facing in the same problem with these pairs of opposites and, and you know what right now are we not being led as humanity to consider this i mean i, I we all think about being isolated, having to deal with COVID, having to, to look deep within ourselves. And so many people have come through with much more um, soul-like qualities than ever before. So in that respect, uh, it's a forcing process, is it not? That we as a humanity are in this state of conflict right now. We're, for, we're being forced to examine, and they say that you know humanity will be ready for the first initiation on mass. So if if this, hopefully this will put us over the edge as as a collective. Well, we hope so. But you know the whole point here is as above, so below. You know we're we're doing it on the individual scale, and we're doing it on the scale of humanity, um, and we see that acting out day to day, don't we? Okay, so this is from um, Problems of Humanity. Um, and I, I don't know, this just warms my heart, so I wanted to share it. Goodwill is for, far more widespread throughout the world than people think. It simply needs to be discovered, educated, and set to work. It must not be exploited, however, by groups working for their own ends, no matter how honestly, correctly, or sincerely. It would, if that was done, be delivered into a partisan effort. The men of goodwill stand midway between opposing groups where such exist in order to create a condition in which discussion and compromise can become happily possible. They tread constantly the noble middle path of the Buddha, which runs between the pairs of opposites, straight to the very heart of God. They tread the narrow way of love of which Christ spoke, and they indicate they are treading it by an expression of the only aspect of love which humanity can at present understand, and that's goodwill. Isn't that a beautiful quote?
quote. Okay, now, we're not going to actually do this meditation, um, but um, there's a practical use that DK gives us in this meditation. He actually gives it to one of his disciples regarding the pairs of opposite. He tells the person to consider the pairs of opposite that the personality faces and to picture them as high mountains that are separated by a narrow pass. On one mountain is in the shade and the other in the light. And the narrow pass between is that golden pathway. And as the soul, observe the personality along that middle way and reflect on the following seeds, seed thoughts. I stand in light, the one who can observe. The distant, wandering one, who is my little self, I call to me. Between the pillars of the way, I pass. I leave these twain on either hand. The middle way leads to a bridge, and on that bridge I stand, and on that bridge I meet myself. And thus the two are one, and harmony is now established. Hmm. So this is something that each of us can use as we're working on the various pairs of opposites. Okay, now... Um, I also want to say, okay, Michael Stacy has put some information in there on the Zoom meeting that begins. We've finished this series, and David Hopper is going to take over with a new series called Journey of the Soul. And Michael Stacy has put that link in there for you to register um, for this new series. He's also, thank you very much, Michael, put the page on Makara where um, – we put the recordings of the uh, our esoteric astrology thing. Now, um, Diana asked what our next course was. Well, we're taking a break because David is is coming in with the the journey of the soul. So, um, uh, someone asked, "What is the icon for the chat box?" Well, it's not really an icon on your little dashboard. Um, you should have. Um, a bunch of gray things with an arrow pointing to the right, and one is going to be um, sharing, one is going to be webcam, one is going to be audio, one is going to be dashboard, one is going to be attendees, one is going to be polls. Below polls, it should say handouts, one of five. If you click that little arrow that's pointed to the right, it points down and it opens it up and it shows you um, what the attachment is, and it's um, a copy of these particular slides, which will also be there on the Makara page once I get it processed and posted. So, right. so David hope. Hopper is going to be taking our spot. There aren't that many spots available because Michael is giving a lot of webinars, and um, you know, between Michael and some of the other presenters, there are just no very little available. So right now, David Hopper will be talking about the nature of the soul, which is very relevant and very good. And we'll think about future. <laughs> yeah, what's how many have we done now? You know, we have other uh, esoteric astrology webinars that we did. We did a series in 2015 and we did a series in 2018. And those are out there. You can watch them. You can get the slides. Um, we've also individually done separate webinars. Um, uh, so there's, and, and Michael has his huge storehouse of webinars out there. Other faculty members have done webinars. And of course, my favorite are the ongoing ones from Francis, the secret doctrine and the secret teaching of all ages. So, okay, well, unless there's any more questions, um, I think we're ready to, to say thank you all and right. glad you enjoyed. Yes, we have a question. Go ahead, Yvonne. I have a really dumb question, BL, since you're, you're my authority on it. What, in the chat box here, what do you do with it if you want to copy it? I mean, do you right click on it, left click on it, and then what do you do? I'm never clear on that. I may not be the only one. Um, in the chat box or the handouts? Uh, when you have the questions here, if you want to, if there's something in the chat box that you want to copy or paste or whatever you say, what do I do on it? 
I uh, think if you click on the link, just click that on the just, link. That it should just open automatically. Or It'll if you want to, if you want to highlight it and copy it, you can save it somewhere. Okay, so if you click on it, it'll take you to your browser. Yeah, it yes. should. Yes, it it's a URL. Yeah, yeah I'm just never, never quite sure what to do with that. Right. Now, what yeah. about handouts? What? How do they do the handouts? They just click on the handouts, it's all there, and then it's a matter of clicking that, and then this should be available, right? Yeah, I think if they click it, it downloads it. Yeah. Right. Clicking on the hand yeah, right clicking on the hand button. Handouts for me has always opened it in the browser, in a yeah, new browser does. window. It does open it in the browser window, but then you have the opportunity there in the browser window to download it. Okay, so are we right clicking or left clicking? You're clicking. I just did it, I, I just did it and I just clicked and it's okay. fine. All I right. think that's the left click. That would be the left click. Okay, I'm sorry. You, you know how good I am at this BL, not. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, neither am I, Yvonne. Thank you. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, lots of thank yous, but I'm not going to read them all, but we really appreciate it. Um, you know, we we did our prior series just for um, more Federation students only, um, and this one we opened up to everybody, and we've got a great turnout, so thank you guys. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. So, and I appreciate all the behind the scenes um, help, Michael, Stacy, and Joe Walsh many times. Yes, um, thank you, thank you, Michael. It, it's very helpful to have um, staff there helping you. So, okay, guys. Well, we're going to say good night, good morning, good afternoon, wherever in the world you are. Um, we appreciate you joining us. Yes, thank you so much, guys. Um, this was a joy. It's, 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 it really was. So we really, you know, like when you tell us that it reaches you, that is very, very good. It's good to hear. So thank yes. you. Bye. Bye. Love you both. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>